This week, Mel Gaynor. For me to communicate with a drum kit, I know is a gift. Mel started drumming as a child. She said, well, Mel, what have you done with my knitting? I said, Mum, how do you know it was me, Mum? He broke the glass ceiling. You never got any, any black drummers in rock bands. It was the, the, the future of what's happening today. He's best known for his work with Simple Minds. I learned that you can destroy a band within minutes. Would Simple Minds have become a stadium band breaking America during Live Aid without him? What better place to be than Philadelphia Stadium? And now drummer Mel is also singer Mel. Robert Palmer took me on tour with him and he said, um, Mel, why haven't you got a mic? And I was like, well, I don't need a mic, I'm the drummer. This is Mel Gaynor. If you put your mind to it, you can do anything. <laughs> So Mel Gaynor, welcome. This is an immense pleasure. And first Hi. of all, I just want to say what a brilliant album. <laughs> I've been, I've been Did listening you like to it? it. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. I've been listening to this all week. And I, and I don't know. I mean, I sort of read things into things quite a lot. But yeah, this yeah. this feels like a bit of a life's work, like a culmination of all your influences. Yeah. You know, and then it's called Come With Me, which feels like come with me into Mel's world. Exactly, you know that's I mean? exactly what it's about, yeah. Absolutely. All right, so tell me about the thinking behind it then first. All right, well, I mean, we we come up with the title track, Come With Me, myself and uh, the guitarist in the band, um, James Ford, uh, we came up with a kind of a riff, and I thought, yeah, that, that sounds great. That, that sounds really good. So he, he came up with this riff, and I started to come out with, you know, a couple of lines, a couple of keyboard lines, a couple of bass lines, and I said, yeah, this sounds really, really, really good. So let me let me go away and just see if I can pen some lyrics to it. And I thought, hold on a minute. This sounds like something which is embracing you and it wants to bring you in. So I thought, okay, great title, come with me. Come with me into the fire, come with me into freedom, come with me into the light. And that's basically where it came from. It's also something like the come with me feels like, and also this track, the first track, Yeah, it's always like, you don't sing at the start, so you have to wait a little bit. That's right. Till you're in it, so it's almost yeah. like come. It's and like get an easy. adventure. It's like an adventure. It's like a journey, and that journey takes you into mysterious, different worlds or different phases and different ideas and different colors, different feelings, and it's just a, a whole journey throughout that song, and that's you know that's what inspired me to come uh, to, to to come out with come with me. With what trepidation did you have actually recording an album where you're singing? Right. Well, I, I didn't get the, let's say, the encouragement uh, until I started to play with um, who was my dear friend, Robert Palmer. Robert Palmer took me on tour with him and he said, um, Mel, why haven't you got a mic? And I was like, well, I don't need a mic. I'm the drummer. And he said, no, but I've heard you sing. And you can sing. And I was like, yeah, but come on, Robert. He said, no, give that man a mic and you got to do BVs with me because I know you're a great singer. And I was like, okay, all right. Um, so it almost started from that. And that was when I took a hiatus from the band um, for a couple of years. And then I went back to the band and I started to kind of sing different songs uh, with me coming out the the, the front, um, and then it, it it basically just started from that. It's a matter of building your confidence to sing. You know, many drummers that sing, including Phil Collins, um, Peter Gabriel, they're kind of thrown into the deep end. But with me, I had to gain confidence to sing to 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 create this album, and it took me all of oh Jesus, well it took me five years to come to get to this stage from the the um, uh, from the, from the start of the album, but it took me another ten years before that to gain the courage to actually get to sing. So it's a it's a fifteen year process, basically. Oh wow, it's amazing when when someone like you, who's one of the world's most famous drummers, who can have, you know, it feels like some sort of insecurity about going into another area. Um, and I find that amazing because, it, you know, that you've had all this drive in your life and you've had all this success in your life. And then you have a little bit of worry. 
Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's a worry about you know. I think if you ask any musician, uh, any like, yeah, musician to sing a song, they'd be like, uh, I don't know if I can do that. Uh, I don't, you know, it takes a lot of courage to do that. And like, hats off to people like Phil Collins, uh, Morris White. He was a, he was a, a, a drummer before he became a singer. And Peter Gable, hats off to them. They just dove, drove straight in and and done it. Um, if you believe that you can do something. Uh, you can do it, but if you don't have that belief or that encouragement as well, and that uh, security within yourself, then you have to build yourself up to it. And um, hey, you know, I'm glad I've got there, and it and it, and it, it sounds good. You know, I'm really proud of what I've done. And uh, people around me saying, "Oh, I didn't know you could sing. Didn't know you could do this. Didn't know, you know? If you put your mind to it, you can do anything." I mean, one thing about "Come with Me," the 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 track. Title track. Um, yeah. Yeah, is that it has this sort of Kashmir esque, and I know you're a, a fan of John Bonham, and it's, and it's what I said at the start. There are these influences in there. So, can you tell me about your um, why you like John Bonham, why you liked his style, and you know? Well, the, and then... first, the first thing is John Bonham was my um, encryption into into playing drums, but John Bonham and and um, Buddy Rich. Uh, I first took up trumpet. That was my first instrument. And that was from my father, because my father played trumpet. So I thought, let me follow in his footsteps. And then John Bonham came on the screen playing this big size drum kit. And I thought, my God, this is what I want. This is what I have to do. You know, and then I saw Buddy Rich and, you know, he, he got into the te technical side of it. But John Bonham was the one that really, really inspired me to play um, because of that bombastic sound. I've always been into that big bombastic sound. Not to say that I can't play anything else because um, the other type of music I kind of cut my teeth on was jazz and jazz funk. So I started off as a jazz funk player, then swapped over to to being a rock player. You know, so I'm I'm you know I'm always switching between rock and jazz and funk and but it was that bombastic sound from John Bonham that really inspired me. What has been the difference about writing songs for yourself to actually like writing in a band like Simple Minds and writing songs for the for the group and for a different singer? Well, I think I think if you if you're um let's say involving yourself within the creative process and then you have to deliver that creative process, i.e. singing, it becomes a different animal. You know, if you're if you're in a group and you're writing together you've got your your part of that um uh embryo let's say so obviously in my case it was the the drums i never thought about playing the bass or or li I, I always listened to bass players but i never thought about writing bass parts writing keyboard parts writing guitar parts writing lyrics even because that was the job of the other people in the band so now thinking about and delivering all different sections and parts of the unit is like, um, wow, you know that that's 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 something something else, something else. When you write in a band, and I know that you've got your sort of parts, as it were, that but it's a collaborative process, and a collaborative process means that other people, I don't want to use the word interfere, but they they can comment on what you're doing, and it can sure, change along involved. the way. Yeah, when you're writing on your own. Who do you have to actually, I don't want to say keep you in check, but do you understand what I mean? Not yeah, uh, me, myself and I. <laughs> I mean, on this on this, on this this situation, I wrote uh, quite a few of the tracks with my brother. So my brother was always like uh, my confidant and my, you know, my, my uh, let's say, um, um, uh, what's, what's the word to describe it? Um, he was a guy I bounced off to for certain ideas, but a lot of a lot of the creative process in, for instance, writing the lyrics, coming out with the melodies, coming out with most of the changes was from me. So I really didn't have too many people apart from my brother to bounce on. Um, and uh, the create this creative process is just kind of uh, a combination of these different factors between my brother. Uh, like I said, James Ford, the guitarist, he wrote the uh, co-wrote with me, come with me. Um, 
There are other tracks I just thought, you know, let me just see if I can write something by myself. And it, they worked out well. You know, there's another track called Song for Peace. I don't know if you heard that. Um, that was completely alone. You know, I wrote that in a in a in a cold room um at the place I was renting at the time and they had an old tinky tonk piano there and I just wrote it on that. So well, let's talk let's talk about the single because Run is gonna be the first single. Yeah. Um I don't know, it had this sort of partly Irish feel to it as well. Yeah, yeah. And and then it hit me, Kirsty McColl, of course. Yeah. Who yeah. you work with. So yeah. tell me a little bit about that track and also about Kirsty. Well, that, that track came along because I, I thought, you know, it was it was a kind of standard track that that um I co-wrote uh with some German people actually. And um it was missing something, and I thought, what is what is what is it? What, what's missing on this, you know? And um, uh, the guitarist I, I was playing with at the time, um, I heard that he played fiddle, and I was like, let me see. And, he, and I heard it, he's really good, so I thought, and he, and he was Irish, and I thought, let me get him in on the session and see what he can, so I sent him the track, and he played me on the phone what he was doing to the track, and I was like, oh my God, it just sounds like, the Pogues, or like you said, Kirsten McCall, and and I was like, Christ, this is this is this is unbelievable. It's really going to sound great. So we got in the studio, we cut that track, first take, with him playing fiddle, and it was just unbelievable. And this was something. I mean, God rest her soul. If Kirsty was alive, I would have definitely got her in to sing um, this track because it's just like it's right up her street, and. Um, and God bless his soul as well. Shane McGowan would have loved it as well. I'm sure he would have loved that. And, you know, it's it's got that Irish kind of folk tinge, which I love about it. And it's unusual. And for, for a first single, for me to come out with a first single with an Irish kind of theme in it, it's like all my Christmas have come true, really. It's, it's, it's you know, and I'm sure... You know, being away from the band for for many years, I think if they hear this song, you know, I think they're they're gonna love it. The importance of you in Simple Minds, I don't think, can be understated. And one of the tracks um, which you're most present on, I would say, is Waterfront. Sure. Um, that track really exploded Simple Minds and made them a stadium band. How mm -hmm. proud of you of that track? And I uh, and and how respectful of the fact are are you of the fact that you were a very important cog in that wheel? Well, um, you know, you know, it's it's kind of weird because, to be quite honest, um, I don't want to go into too much too too many political issues about the band, but I think it was sometimes understated what what actually happened within Simple Minds. Um, I'm very very proud of the work I've done with them. And that includes Don't You Forget About Me and, and um, like you said, Waterfront, Alive and Kicking. But Waterfront was was kind of the, the the pinnacle of us just coming up and breaking through that 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 kind of new romantic mold into the, the the kind of stadium rock mode. And that that was um that was something that became the process from um, Steve Lillywhite producing such a hard sound on that on that particular album and that particular track um so yeah i'm very very proud of that track very proud of that track what do you think in retrospect and i don't mean this in a political way but what did you think what do you think that 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 they may have learned from you because people always talk about when you meet someone um what you learn from them but i just wondered what they may have learned from you um you know something? That's that's a good question, but I can't answer that question because I'm not them. Um, but I I would love I would love to hear what they have to say about learning from me because I don't think they so much learn from me. I don't know. I I don't I, like I said I can't answer that question. But I think I learned that you can um, you can destroy a band within minutes or within months but i think something that should be learned is that you stick together and that's that's something that i learned from that i don't know what they've learned from that but i, I that if people stick together and people in bands 
i.e. U2, Rolling Stones, they all stick together, then you get the reward. Yeah, that's fantastic to say that, I think, because you hear about so many bands who have internal issues. And as a music fan, it's a real disappointment. Everybody when... has internal issues. Families have internal yeah. issues, you know, but as your family, you stick together. If you don't, the family falls apart, you know, and that's, you know, one thing, and that's what I've learned. And, and I think um, for me to say, what have they learned about their situation? I don't think they've learned anything, to be quite honest. I think they've just haphazardly just moved on. And I think they haven't learned from what uh, mistakes were made within, within that unit. Now let's move on to Keep On Believing because uh, another track there and th i mean this is a real corker i think as well and it's got sort of heavy moments um oh. to this track and one thing that i've really understood about you by doing all this research and listening to things that you've been involved in is that you really do straddle genres oh. with everything you do and this one does that oh. um in I don't know. It's, it feels like in a, many ways that this reflects you growing up in a family uh, that had different heritages, you know, Jamaican and Brazilian, uh, and almost like your life straddled. Yeah. Is that is that true to say that? In well, I mean, keep on believing came from the, 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 the kind of concept of being in a rock band. And for many black musicians especially drummers that was unheard of you never got any any black drummers in rock bands and i was probably one of the first to be in a in, in a rock band called samson now from from that genre i was thinking god you know maybe i should come back to a song on this album that reminds me of that 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 um uh, situation, you know, that, that, that period, because it was a rock band, but it was a progressive rock band and it had some progressive overtones in there. So I thought, you know, as homage to Samson, I'd come out with keep on believing. And that was something which was, everybody was looking around in the studio. It was like, this is a bit heavy mill, but no, 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 let's, let's go with it because we, we should encompass and incorporate the rock part of me as well. And that comes out in Fire in the Rain as well. You know, that, that's quite a heavy, heavy piece as well. So, you know, and, that, and I want to appeal to the, 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 the progressive rock audience as well. And, I mean, uh, that's, I think what you're saying is really interesting because when we grow up, we also have figures that are our representation. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember talking to Lee John, who I know obviously that uh, mm -hmm. uh, you work with, and he was telling me that when he was in New York with his father and seeing, you know, Michael Jackson on TV, seeing Diane Carroll, seeing uh, um, African-Americans on TV was something that made him realise he could also achieve his dreams. But who were your uh, representation figures? Were there any? Jesus Christ. <laughs> There's so many. I mean, you, you could think of Marvin Gaye. You could think of Stevie Wonder. Because uh, Stevie Wonder leapt across a lot of boundaries as well, musically. You know, he went from some rock stuff, some funk stuff. You know, he he, he incorporated a lot of stuff. Sly and the Family Stone was a big influence on me. Again, rock to funk. Um, Bob Marley was a big influence on me. Um, I suppose a lot of the time it was drummers because, you know, obviously, you know, coming from a drumming background, Billy Cobham was a big influence. Um, you know, Max Roach, um, Tony Williams, you know, loads and loads of drummers, but also a lot of singers as well. well I think one of my favourite singers uh, was Donny Hathaway, uh, effort, effortlessly singing. And um, he was a big part of, of, of what I strive to, to, to try and sound like. Not that I sound like him at all, but that's something which is in my head all the time. He's phrasing the way he... You know, he, 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 he I, I don't know, he takes a simple song and just turns it around, you know, and he had, he actually, um, um, uh, he, he had some corkers of songs um, that, you know, 
you, um, you got a friend. He he just he he, he turned that on its head, you know. And uh, even Carol King said, you know, uh, or who is it actually wrote that? Was it Carol King? I think it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, Carol sure. King. I think it was Carol King. I think I heard her in an interview say that you know Donny Hathaway's version was just sublime, sublime. What could what sort of sound could you achieve with your mother's knitting needles? Yeah, <laughs> well, a kind of slap slap sound. Um, you know, she she uh, she used to get really furious when I when I took her knitting needles out and put them back bent. You know, and and I you know I I tried to get out of it. You know, but I'm, I'm a terrible liar. And uh, she said, "Well, Mel, what have you done with my knitting?" Needles? I said, "Mum, how do you know it was me, Mum?" She said, "Look, I know you want to play drums. My knitting needles are bent." She wasn't. She didn't get annoyed. She just said, "Well, I'm going to buy you some drumsticks, and then see how we go." And then after that, she 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 bought me a kit, and so she was quite patient with me alongside my dad. When were they first aware of your talent? Um, when I when I started to bang out beats on the settee, uh, and then they bought me my first drum kit, which was like a almost like tin cans. Then I started to play rhythms on there, and, and they said, "Right, okay." we need to get you a decent drum kit. And uh, from about 11, I got my first drum kit, which was again, very small. Um, and then I used to practice in the shed and I started to speak to a couple of musicians and uh, they built their own drum kits. One, one drummer built their own drum kit. And I said, well, let me see if I can do that. I'll build, I'll build my own toms, build my own bass drum. So, you know, my father was an engineer and I got his knowledge to try and, you know, glue the different woods together and the different plies together and bend them. And, you know, it was a whole process, but I, I built pretty much a drum kit around this and, and, and started to play. Many uh, musicians I've talked to have sort of ex said that getting into music was sometimes an escape um, of their situation. Was it with you a form of communication? <laughs> I would say yes, it was a, a form of communication because although, you know, if you if you look at ancient times, you know, Stone Age times or whatever else, cavemen times, you know, they used to beat the drum. And, and, and again, with African um, tribes, they used to beat drums to, to, to communicate. So it is a form of communication. And uh, that's something which hasn't been lost through music and through playing drums. And... Um, uh, it's just advanced to obviously a, a, another level, but yeah, it is a form of communication. And um, for me to communicate with a drum kit um, is is something which I have, you know, which I know is a gift, you know, and I I I uh, I, I really honour that and treasure that. I mean, you played, you were started to play in clubs at fourteen. You started to play professionally at sixteen. But in a sense, you know, I mean, the story of someone like Elton John as Reg Dwight was really like a touring performer hammering out every night on stage, learning the craft. Yeah. Was was that a period where you really learnt not only the craft of drumming, but also learnt how to respect an audience from the stage and how to perform with other musicians? Was that the moment that that all came together? Yeah, I mean, from the age of sixteen, I was, I was, you know, on the road, as it were, on the road with the flirtations. So that 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 actually was a step forward, a big step forward for me to play professionally. So after that, I, um, I, you know, after that tour, it was really cutting teeth with many different musicians, recordings, um, and engagements. You know, so to cut my my teeth at the age of 16 on the road was just was just unbelievable and then my brother used to take me to loads of gigs at an early age as well so it was it was really something which i i uh i i hold dear to my heart because it was it was just such a challenge to be on the road at that age and you're cutting your teeth and you're learning all the time and uh yeah it was a real experience real experience yeah. Another track on the album, Dangerous, has this sort of fusion feel to it. Can you tell me about that? Well, Dangerous was, um, again, it's a riff-based song. Um, now, it was, it, the whole thing came about with 
just being in diverse, dangerous situations. And I thought, oh, let me let me try and get something which is going to reflect that or, or, or reflect that into lyrics. You know, when something's dangerous, you know, you don't see where you're going. You can't foretell what's going to happen. You know, it's dangerous, but you, you you don't know what to do, you know, and that and it came came from that embryo. And it's and the one with the guitar solo on, isn't it? That's, a... that's right, yeah, yeah. That's the one with the long guitar solo. So it's I think there's a guitar solo in nearly every track. Yeah. <laughs> but um uh yeah, that one is 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 kind of a it's kind of a bluesy thing as well, you know. It was a, it was it was a riff riff basing and it was a riff based blues thing. And um and it yeah, it just came from that. And, uh, you know, living on the edge, living on a dangerous time and, you know, all that sort of thing. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, Billy Cobham and, of course, um, and I presume Narada Michael Walden and the Mahu Vishnu, Mahu Vishnu orchestra. Yeah. Yeah, orchestra. What, what was so appealing about that band to you? Well, that band, I mean, I saw that band live once, only once, and that was uh, the Rainbow. Uh, I think my brother took me to that. And when they come out, they came out with a track called Meeting of the Spirits. And I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. I mean, it was just like, what, what is this? You know, um, it was just completely mind blowing, completely mind blowing. And the, the, the thing is, the, the funny thing is, they used to support people like Cream. Um, uh, they, they supported quite a lot of like big bands, Santana in the, in the back in the day, and they completely blew them off. I mean, when when they when they uh, you know when they these bands followed them, they, the, the the whole audience was just <laughs> we don't want to know about you. <laughs> We've just seen the best band in the world, kind of thing. Same thing that happened, used to happen with Earth and Fire. You know, Earth and Fire used to go on as uh, supporting uh, you know big acts, and they 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 completely blew them off because it was something so different. Something so out of the ordinary, it was uh, it was mind blowing. But certainly with my vision, it, it took me to um, the level of understanding complex music. You know, it wasn't like you know twelve bar music. It was you know intricate chords and different time signatures, and you know and that that kind of open open my musical world up. The interview with Mel Gaynor continues, but I just want to ask you to subscribe. It helps you because you'll hear about all the new podcasts immediately. I upload them and it helps me, of course. So here we go, Mel Gaynor. I think we're the same age, but in the late 70s, early 80s, there was the British funk revolution in a way. This... Uh, and it was the first time that um, artists who have been influenced from uh, America made their own music. And you were uh, you were in light of the world. Yep. There were other bands like, um, got to remember them now, Link, Central Line, stuff yep. like that. And yep. there was this whole new movement. Um, how important do you think that movement um, was for, I would say, black music in England, you know, in Britain? Uh well, I mean it was it was the, the the future of what's happening today. I mean, from from Light of the World came out Beggar and Company, Incognito, um, and certain members of Freeze. You know, it was it was kind of there was a, a few band, a few members, ex members in Light of the World were, were, were in Freeze as well, or played on the Freeze, Freeze record. So there's a lot of different influences and um beginnings from the brit funk scene and i think without those bands there wouldn't be a brit funk scene you know certainly not in funk you know i think the the reggae revolution came at pretty much the same time and uh, that kind of took off in one direction the brit funk thing took off in another direction so it was you know bands like high tension as well were in that in that that kind of circle um, I, I I interviewed DC Lee the other day, and she said it was like the first time that she felt spoken to um, directly, rather than the American music, which wasn't speaking to her directly, but she liked. This was 
people like her who was had the same experiences speaking to her yeah. yeah and when i mentioned about having these figures um that you look up to and uh identify with in a sense all the people of that era including yourself have become these identification figures um yeah i think i think realistically i think you know and that's very kind of you to say that, but um, I don't look at it as that. I look at it as that it was part of my youth and it was part of my growing up. And um, to be, you know, to be, let's say, part of the, the beginning of that, um, yeah, it's an identification of what's going on or what's what went on in the history. But, you know, I, I feel like it was part of my youth and part of my growing up. So as far as... Um, uh yeah i'm a yeah a part of it responsible for it um but i don't see it as like a a legendary status as it were you know it's 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 something that was a part of me growing up musically another track on the album is um chris isaac's um wicked game yeah. which you've done this amazingly haunting <laughs> version when you when you know Wicked, Wicked Game from Chris Isaac, it's hard to believe that you can hear that track and say, I can do something different with it. Do you but know the, what the, I mean? The, the original is quite haunting anyway. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Guitar and everything else. But I, I just wanted to pull it back and strip it back and 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 come out with something which is going to be really ingrained and really haunting and really almost ghostly, you know, because... The, the versions, I've heard a couple of versions of it, and it was, they were quite trashy, quite trashy, which were great. I mean, they really were good, but nothing's, uh, they didn't pull back the the, the, the actual essence of the, the lyrics and everything else. So um, I have I just wanted to come out with a, a, an actual version, which was really going to set the, 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 uh, the lyrics on fire, as it were. Is that your daughter, Melissa, on the track? Yes, it is, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But in terms of that, when you know, when we grow up, we want our parents to give us their confirmation. Mm. Um was there a time that you received that from your parents where they said to you, you know, you're really good, you're good at what you do. And is this a time where by having, by working with Melissa, you're paying her that respect? Yeah, I mean, my parents uh oh, my father died at quite an early age. Um, but he, he was right behind me, you know, he didn't see me get to the big stage. Uh, my, my mother did, um, and she was really proud and, um, she never actually got to see myself and Melissa sing together. Um, but he, yeah, I mean, it's, it's great to, to, to have my daughter on board, you know, to, to sing with me because it was, it's, uh, it's, it's a great, um, family outing or family group and also my brother is actually going to be one of the, the other guitarists on stage as well so it's going to be a, a family affair let's say but yeah my mother and my mother and father were really proud of, of my achievements definitely who did you get to produce this album and in terms of production because you've worked with some amazing uh people over the years yep, I, have, yep. I produced the album um alongside uh, an engineer called Andy Brook. Uh, he didn't co-produce it, but he, he was a great engineer and he, he, he was very, very, very good at giving ideas. But I produced the whole album, uh, self-produced, and um, uh, it was remixed by a guy called Michael Smith, who's, a, who's another engineer who's, a, who's an absolute genius when it comes to mixing. So it was a combination of those factors and... Um, but it was yeah no it was me who was who was actually producing it all, and one of the one of the things which was kind of confused confusing for me, because um, five years ago I it got to the stage where it was meant to come out uh, just before COVID obviously COVID hit we couldn't tour it we couldn't bring it out because it was no point, so um, I left it alone for five years and it was only this year that uh, no sorry last year that it got remixed and um because I, I i just couldn't i couldn't hear it anymore because i was too close to it 
So I handed it over to this remix engineer and he'd done an incredible job and um, it sounds fresher than ever. What's the difference about writing a new song to actually either doing a cover uh, you know, taking or getting someone else's song. Like I remember you talked about "Don't You Forget About Me," yeah, um, and that came from Keith Fawcett. And Keith Fawcett, yeah, Fawcett. Okay, yeah. and um, then you're putting your own. You're having to sort of define your own input into it. So, what is the difference? Um, I think realistically, when you listen to a song in its basic form. And then you present it, which in our case, to a band, uh, that band will put its own spin on on the track. Because we we cut that track in pretty much one or two takes from memory. And um, the whole thing, the whole breakdown section actually came from me. You know, I, I just broke, broke everything down, you know, and then, you know, done this massive feel to bring it in. And so... You know, it's it's down to the musicians in the band to develop their own arrangement for that song. You know, it's the same thing with uh, another another um, uh, another um, uh, title on the album, which is the cover, another cover, which is "Addicted" from Robert, Robert Palmer. That was um, I put my own spin on that as well because it was something which I didn't really feel that was heavy enough. So I made it heavier, uh, a heavier version, and uh, that was the result of um, of that version of Addicted. Just going back to Don't You Forget About Me, it was a track that was turned down by a number of artists, including Bowie, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. Roxy Music, Psychedelic Fields, you know, it's, it's quite a few people turned it down. Do you think it's because they possibly couldn't just didn't see it fitting them or they couldn't see a way through or I don't know why people you know what it just seems when that song is such an iconic song and such an amazing song that yeah. it feels a bit weird that anyone could ever turn it down but I never heard the demo <laughs> yeah no what it was I think I think a lot of it was um um a lot of it was the uh let me see I think it's because of the verses were were kind of a bit weird. They weren't. They, they weren't. They didn't set the world on fire until you got to that. You know, till you got to that kind of chorus. But the the hey 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 hey's weren't in there as well on the original record. So that's something which which I don't think anybody picked up on. You know, and they didn't they didn't make it their own. And I think if if I'm sure if David Bowie would have done it. He would have made it his own and he would have he would have done a great version, but we never know that. We never know that. You touched on Far in the Rain earlier. Yeah. And yeah. it does feel like another single possibility to me. Yeah. It feels like something that's could really yeah. work as a single. Yeah. Just tell me a little bit about that track. Um Fire in the Rain came up um with uh with some some something um just excuse me, Steve. Wait, can you come out? Did you keep humming? Wait. Can you come on? on live? Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, uh, Fire in the Rain came together again through a German, uh, uh, German writer who I who I wrote Run with, um, and that was something which was kind of almost there, but it didn't have that element of uh, a deliverance, let's say. So. I came out with the lyric fire in the rain, you know, what, what does fire in the rain mean? And, um, you know, the, the actual watch, said, Oh, that's a really good idea. Fire in the rain. Let me, let me see if we can piece stuff together around that as well. So that, that came together pretty quickly, you know, just from having that lyric there. So that was, uh, yeah, that was something which was, which was good. Another interview I did recently was, was with the American journalist Larry Flick, who used to work for Billboard and quite a sort of respected journalist. And he has this theory that the seventh track on the album is the artist's favourite and the second track will be the first single. And uh, I don't know if the listing that I got is how it's going to come out, but the second track was Run, <laughs> which is the single, and the seventh track is Little White Lies. So is that true? <laughs> My God, did he actually say that? 
yeah, yeah. And he said, you can go through anybody's albums. And it's, and I've done it. I've done it with loads of albums that I've got. And you can see, you know, you see it. It's just amazing. My God. I, don't, I can't believe that. So is Little White Lies your favourite track on the album? It is. Yeah, tell me why. Uh, it was one of the first tracks that was written, actually, um, from from w- within the collection of the album. And I thought it, the original the original concept we had wasn't really cutting it. Um, so I pulled it out again and I was like, what can we do to this? So I come up with this kind of intro. Um, and kind of rewrote the the um, the the verse part in a in a in a way that it was it was lower because I, I the, the first version we had the verses were higher in 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 um, in pitch to the to the chorus and it, it was a bit disorganized a bit disjointed. So we kind of swapped that around, um, and I came up with having the verse low, lower, lower in pitch, then move obviously up to the to the chorus, and that's kind of the way that came about. And and the first part was the first part of the uh, intro wasn't was never there. That was a, that was a completely new part which I came up with because I rewrote the track. Um, so that was. And then it, when when everybody heard that, they thought, "Oh my god, that yeah, that could be a single." And I was like, "Really?" And they said, "Yeah, that that that's that's the single." And that was actually the first single, which was going to be put out on the album. And then we got the um, publicity people and PR people involved, and they said, "No, no, no, we have to put Run out first. So Run's the first single. Well, that theory you you can go through your record collection. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm definitely going to do that. And funny enough, the second second single was Little White Lies. So, yeah, brilliant. And the second single is normally the one that's the biggest hit of an, of of an album. So there you go. Let's hope so. Let's, hope so. Um, let's, let's talk about why can't we live together? Because whenever I hear that sentence, I obviously think of Timmy Thomas in the in oh, the seventies. Right. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. I, and I just wondered whether there was a sentiment there which comes from that. Right. That was a that was a direct pitch to. You know the world happenings. You know, I mean, why can't we live together? Why do we have to go through so much war? You know, and and and, and disruption, upheaval. Why can't we just live together? Why can't we just be together as one and live together? And that that's where that stemmed from, basically. You know, and and it's more or less in 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 kind of the kind of vein of the police. That's 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 my thinking behind that, you know, because really this project started out as a trio and uh, it, it embellished from there. So it, it started out as a trio and for a trio to play that, I was keeping in mind the police. So if the police were to play that, it would be, you know, right up their street. And I thought, OK, let's put a tinge of reggae in there to make it kind of upbeat. And, uh, you know, and that's that's where it got to, really, on that one. I mean, we're of a generation where music has had such a massive um, impact politically, socially, and I'm not saying it doesn't today. I'm sure there are artists that are still having a massive political and social impact, but we're of a generation that's lived through that. And one event in your life was one of the most massive events in all our lives, which was Live Aid. Yep. And I'm just wondering that, you know, you're pay- they're playing to, I don't know what it was, I'm going to say a billion people worldwide, but you've got 80,000 people in the stadium. How is that compared to another gig? What does it mean as a performer on that on that stage? Well, I mean, first and foremost, we came from recording Once Upon a Time, which is like Woodstock in the middle of nowhere, in the woods, and then we arrived in Philadelphia to a massive stadium, with you know, um, you know, everybody and their mothers there, um, and you know, being introduced on stage by an iconic figure, Jack Nicholson, and it was like, Christ, what is this? You know, we've arrived, <laughs> and. Um, and it was just a great feeling, you know. It was a great feeling because we weren't sure we were going to get uh, get 
flown back to um, uh, flown back to Wembley to the UK to to actually perform in, in Wembley Stadium. And the record company said, no, 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 no. We need to we need to get Simple Minds in America because that's where we're going to break. And um, it's you know we 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 want to test them out on the American audience. And we did, you know, don't you was rising up the charts at the time. So what better, what better place to be than Philadelphia Stadium? And it was just like mind blowing to play there. Mind blowing. I mean, I had a night out with Simple Minds, uh, Glitter Ball, which was in Bilbao. Oh. And I don't think I ever forget that night. <laughs> well, I sort of forgot it. Cause, cause I, bet it was... didn't, I bet you didn't forget Derek Forbes. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, suddenly everyone jumped on me and they're in this restaurant and they've got these guys lying on top of me. <laughs> it was just hysterical. I don't know. It was one of the funniest <laughs> nights of my life. So I just wondered, when you're with a group of guys like that, after Live Aid, how do you celebrate? Well, that celebration went on for... I mean, actually, you know something? We didn't actually celebrate that much because I think we had a night in New York. Then the next day, we went straight back in the studio because we were, we were still in the studio at the time. We were still cutting once upon a time. So we didn't really celebrate to that extent. Obviously, we had a night, you know, in, in, in New York, and that was it. Next day, we were back in the studio in the middle of the woods. So for us, it was like a shock. It was like going from mass glory to like you know trees and sheep and oh god what happened there you know it was it was just like crazy but it was good i mean it was great i mean it was a great time great atmosphere um but it was short-lived because of, you know because we were recording at the time we were busy i want to come to the last track you've already talked about it a bit um addicted to love it's a track that you released i think also in 2003 when robert palmer passed and obviously recorded and was due for release and then he passed and was uh, released in his honour afterwards. Um, and you mentioned that he was the person that brought you to singing. How, he? I presume, you know, I mean, he's on the track, so he must have heard the track, the final version and everything. Yeah, yeah. How did he react to it? And what, he loved you know, it. He absolutely loved it. He adored it. I mean, I was kind of a bit apprehensive about playing it to him because... His version was incredible as well. Um, and I thought, you know, shall we play it to him? Yeah, let's play it to him. So we, he played it to him and he was knocked out. He was really shot. He said, that's one of the best versions I've ever heard. Because quite a few people have done it. Tina Turner, I believe, done it. Um, a few other people in the States done it. I, I can't remember who. But he said that's one of the best versions that he's heard. I mean, you've, you you work with Tina Turner, you work with Elton John. You've mm -hmm. toured with Robert Palmer. You've been, you've worked with, you know, the, the most amazing artists mm -hmm. uh, on the planet. Um, and I want to ask the same question I asked you about Simple Minds and whether you have an answer, whether you feel that you have an impact on these greats, that you give them something when you work with them. Well, I hope so. I mean, you know, I think uh, if you if you listen to the Tina Turner stuff that I was on, listen to the Elton John stuff that I was on, you know, they all were singles. And um, you know, it's 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 great that they asked me to 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 play with them. You know, I'm honored that they asked me to play with them. Um the same the same way I'm honored to be to 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 be a part of being a part of Simple Minds. You know, it was it was a great iconic situation and um you know i i just want to have some kind of inroads to creating that success with my record as well uh not blowing my own trumpet but i think i think that we've come out with something which could be quite good and something which could be quite special so you know i think when it gets out to the listening public i hope and i pray that you know that we can we can further that situation by you know visiting visiting them and and touring and 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 you know and and being a part of that successful chain again. Well, Mel Gaynor, I mean, it's a great album. Come with me, and I really enjoyed it, and it's been great to meet you. And I want to finally say, I just want to thank you because I think you've made such a contribution to music and popular culture 
um, through your work over your life that I just want to say from my heart, thank you very much for that. And I wish you much success with this thank album. You very much. Thank you very much, Steve. That's great. Great to hear from you. And uh, it's great to talk to you. And uh, I'm sure we'll meet again. Up there is an interview I recommend. Down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews. And here is where you can connect. Thank <laughs> you.